Matt and I are delighted to be with you again. He and I have a special connection. We worked together when he was a master's student, but when we met, we figured out that we had a connection in the whitewater rafting community. I grew up in Northern California and spent some time guiding. Matt's family owned a whitewater rafting company that runs the main and middle fork of the salmon and some other rivers in Idaho and California. And we knew some of the same people in the whitewater rafting industry. And the other thing we have in common is we can't think about anything in life without thinking about rivers and running rivers. So we're going to talk today a little bit about kind of our experience of running the river because in some ways it's a lot like life and maybe business experiences that we have. On a river, in the river that I, that I guided on, um, in the town that I grew up in, about every couple of weeks in the summer, there would be a news story about somebody who had had a tragedy. And it's because they would go down to the river and they think, hey, I've got a boat and I've got a paddle, and so I'm just going to go down the river. And sometimes they would have beer, which made things worse. And they would jump in and think that just because they had a boat and a paddle, they could cruise down the river and be OK, and it would end up in a tragedy. And to some extent, our lives are like that. You may be familiar with Clayton Christensen's uh, work, How Will You Measure Your Life, where he talks about how he'd been a student at Harvard. And when he looks at some of the people that were there with him, these are people who are smart and talented musically and often good athletes, that they have what most people think they would want to create a good life. They can go out and make a lot of money and uh, you know, become leaders in industry. What was surprising to him is that many of these people, even though they were smart and talented, ended up in bad places. So he talked about, I think it's Schilling and Lay that were at Enron, some of the other of his colleagues. Their families were a mess. They ended up divorced and they had problems in business. So the question is that he brings up is, how do these people who have kind of what most of us might want in terms of building a great life end up in bad places? And he, so he asked the question, how will you measure your life? This gets us thinking a lot about how do we end up in bad places and can we be more intentional in terms of building a good life? This kind of parallels what happens on the river where people maybe think that they can do it, but they, they aren't really prepared. Or, as I said, in life, in our game of life, that we might end up in a bad place. So as Mark already alluded to a little bit, there are sort of these preconceived notions about river rafting with some people that, hey, this looks fun. We can throw a boat on the river. We can go and have a good time. It's going to be great. And, and really, these are, these are myths. There's more to having a successful river trip than just having a boat and jumping on and going. There's, there's unseen hazards. There's keeper holes. There's strainers. There's things that you don't necessarily see with an untrained eye that can, that can have a negative impact um, or even a life-threatening impact on your overall experience. But to have a good time, you can do things in terms of gaining knowledge, skills, having an intentional plan with what you're trying to do, right? So there's maps, maps that will tell you where certain rapids or other hazards are, where you can stop and camp. Um, you may also come to certain rapids where you'll need to stop and scout, right? Depending on the water level, rapids change, condition, conditions change. So you want to be aware of those things. There's a certain degree of skill to just read the river, to understand which currents are safe, which aren't, where this rapid should be run, where it shouldn't be. In addition to then just knowing how to paddle your boat or row your boat. And if you do these things and you plan intentionally, you can have really a great, great experience. And that's really sort of a, I think, a core topic of what we want to talk about today is how do we intentionally get down the river in a way that allows us to have, or in life, that allows us to have a really great and rewarding experience. So there's been some research by Sonia Libanowski at Stanford around happiness. And one of the things that she found is that people have a perception about what will make them happy that involves myths. And so three of the primary myths come around issues of it must be found, which means I'll be happy when I graduate or when I get a job at PwC or when I you know, get married. At that point, I will be happy. And in reality, it's interesting because students that we talk to will be so excited about graduating, we see them five years later, and what do they tell us? Wish I was back in school. So there's, this is a myth that things are going to get better. Can you believe wanting to be back in school? We, we get this all the time. Another one is it lies in changing our circumstances. If I could just get a different boss 
or a better car or change my house, then I'll be happy. A third one is we either have it or we don't. There's some sort of kind of we're a happy person or we're not. An interesting study was conducted by a psychologist at a University of Illinois named Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. And they had an intact group. So they had high school students. And they found some who, after school, go and hang out at the mall. Then they had another group who they called the chore kids. So the mall kids would finish school and go to the mall and do whatever you do at a mall. Hang out, flirt, shop, you know, things like that. The chore kids would go home after school. They would do homework. They'd do chores. They would go to piano practice, then to softball or soccer practice, then come home, maybe do the dishes, eat with their family, do some more homework, and go to bed. So they asked all of these kids, who's having more fun? Who do you want to be? Who did they all want to be? Yeah, they're like, hey, the mall kids have it made. That's the life that I want. Then they administered measures of psychological well-being and life satisfaction. Which group scored higher? So what's up with this? Everybody wants to be a mall kid, but the chore kids score higher. We're going to talk a little bit about a theory around quality of life that explains why it is that being a chore kid is better than being a mall kid. Part of it has to do with this research by Sandra Labernowski at Stanford, where what she found is there is indeed a genetic disposition. But even if you're not disposed to be a super happy person, you still have substantial influence over how you create a good life. The irony here is, their research suggests that only 10% of our happiness is actually influenced by circumstances. Where most of us might think 90% of our life happiness is influenced by circumstances or our environment. This area of intentionality is interesting because most of us aren't trained about how we create a good life. We're trained to be accountants, or we're trained to be CPAs, or engineers, or financial analysts. But we don't spend a bunch of time training and thinking about how you really create a good life. What we're going to talk about is the research that helps us understand what you do in this 40% to really create a good life. So as, as Mark has talked about, and I think it's obvious from some of these examples, that the, the path to happiness isn't always the way that it seems or appears upon first blush. And let me, let me tie this back to our river analogy. There's a, there's a rapid on the main salmon uh, river, which is in, in central Idaho. It's called Big Mallard. And when you approach Big Mallard, you're on a fairly calm, straight section of the river, and the river makes a big bend to the left. And as you, as you come up to the top of the rapid, and if you hadn't stopped to scout, and if you hadn't talked to people or read anything about this rapid, the way it presents itself is that you should go down the right side. Down at the bottom, you can see that there's some nasty stuff and some big waves and some rocks. And the right looks pretty Good, you know, there's some waves and we can just sort of go down the right side and ride it out. What's happening though, is the way that the river curves, all of the current comes out to the right and then changes direction back towards the bottom left of the river where there's this great big rock that's either a big rock that you're gonna wrap your boat around or it's gonna be a pour over and you're gonna flip your boat. The actual route is down the left side, which does not look like where you want to go. You actually slow your boat down. Usually I'll row backwards for speed, but I'll go in frontwards, slow the boat down, and you carefully work your way down the left, left side, and there's a small gap at the bottom that you shoot through. It's one of my favorite rapids, right? But first blush, and if you don't have the requisite skills or knowledge, and you're not being intentional about how you're running the river, you're going to run into some real problems in this particular rapid. So some other myths beyond the first three, they're kind of a subset, are pretty common. Aristotle talked about these many years ago. But in the research, they found that these continue to be myths, that people believe they make a lot of money if they get power, if they're beautiful, if they get a lot of pleasure, that then they'll be happy. So they'll seek those things as though they are valuable ends in and of themselves. So wealth, for example, the research suggests that once you're above the poverty level, it has very little impact on happiness. When people make a lot of money or start or come into a lot of money, there's a, a, a small boost in overall happiness for a period of time, and they go back to where they were. So wealth isn't a huge issue when it comes to happiness. Another factor is pleasure. And this is interesting. So hedonists would think the more pleasure that you get and the less pain that you have, the better your life. Psychologists have identified a phenomena which they call hedonic adaptation. Hedonic adaptation is the principle that as human beings, 
we quickly adapt to good things. So if you imagine when you graduated from college, if you were a poor college student, which most of us are, you're thinking, man, can't wait to go out to dinner now instead of eating Top Ramen every day. Anybody eat Top Ramen? Just me? And so you go to McDonald's three or four times. It's like, well, that was good, but man, I want something better. And so you go to Denny's, and that's kind of expensive for you until you get a promotion. You keep thinking, wow, I can go to get something better. And the same thing's true of cars. You buy a car, and maybe it's a used Accord, and you drive it around for a while. It's like, mm, man, a new one would be good. And then it's like, I really need an Acura. You get your Acura, and you're driving around. It's like, you know what? That Porsche is better than the Acura. We quickly adapt to good things. So people who focus on external goods like materialism related to pleasure or getting good things tend to adapt really quickly. When pleasure happens as a natural course of our life, it's a really good thing. But focusing on it as the ultimate end doesn't lead to happiness. There's a, another point kind of from the opposite perspective that is really powerful about human nature. When people experience traumatic events that impair their ability to function, like they lose their eyesight because of an injury or the use of their legs, in that first year when they're going through rehab and treatment, they might experience severe levels of depression and even suicidal ideation. After that first year, research suggests that 70 to 80 percent of the people report a higher quality of life than prior to the injury. Humans quickly adapt to difficult things also. And part of that is that challenge of dealing with that adversity actually makes us appreciate and become more grateful for the senses or abilities that we still have. Beauty is an interesting one because it's such a powerful force in our culture and in our media. I spend time with students talking about beauty and this kind of myth of happiness, particularly around feminine beauty. So if I ask a class, what does the perfect woman look like? They describe specifically height, hair color, eye color, you know, neoteny, which is symmetric, symmetry in the face, and a number of other features. And when you look at those in whole, and I ask groups, well, what percentage of women actually look like that naturally? It's like nobody does without surgery. And so the question is, if you're, if you're a woman and you're walking down the street and you see someone who's really beautiful, think, man, I wish like, I looked like that, then I would be happy. The research suggests that's not true. And in part, if you think about it, what does that beautiful woman see when she looks in the mirror? <laughs> yeah, they're flaws. That experience is common regardless of what you look like, that most of us tend to see our flaws. So focusing on beauty really doesn't make us happy. I just wanted to give you a quick example here. So good looking people are not any happier. Happy people perceive themselves as more good looking. Believing you are good looking makes you happy. Now, you, you, meet, you meet people who are like average looking, but they're just really engaging and they look more beautiful. Really interesting principle here. And so the examples that we had, do any of you know Monty Swain? So Monty's a faculty member here. Or, or, so there's Monty. Monty thinks he's good looking. He's a super happy guy because of it. Now, this other person we also know is a happy person, but they dressed up to be good looking. Does anybody know who that is? That's Jeff Wilkes again. We had to pick on him. So, so <clears throat> this is another myth that really this focus on beauty is something that undermines our happiness. Power is another one. People think, when I become the CEO, then I'll be happy. And this is tricky because the reward of leadership is in helping your group succeed, in building relationships of trust with those that you work with. And people who use power when they're extrinsically motivated destroy relationships and don't have a good experience. And, and even those who are great leaders, it's sometimes a lonely place. Right, Steve? <laughs> uh, we should have put your picture up here with power. I didn't know you were going to be here. We would have. So it, it should be obvious now that happiness isn't necessarily all it's cracked up to be and may not even be what we're ultimately trying to, trying to achieve. When you think about it, many of us do things intentionally that don't at first make us happy, right? If you look at this picture, you have people involved in different uh, outdoor recreation activities. When you go mountaineering, our colleague Stacy Taniguchi has been mountaineering all over the world and you have altitude sickness and nausea and extreme physical conditions, yet people choose to do this intentionally, right? If you get up and go running in the morning, there's all types of things that we do in our lives that aren't just to make us immediately happy. We all, we'll pay mo money to go to movies that make us sad or scare us. And th this idea that the end result of 
or the what we're seeking for isn't necessarily always happiness. So Matt, Matt's too young to know how scary Jaws was. So I asked some of my students, they're like, it's not scary. I'm like, how many of you were scared to death to go into the water after watching Jaws? You paid money to have that experience. Okay, so it still is a relevant movie reference. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> um, so, Thank you for raising your hand. Yeah. So Edward Deasy, another psychologist who's, who's been involved in the positive psychology movie had the, or movement had this to say. In truth, happiness is not all that it is cracked up to be, and most people don't really want to be happy all the time anyway. He goes on to say, the true meaning of being alive is not just to feel happy, but to experience the full range of human emotions. James E. Faust builds upon this by saying, obviously there is a great difference between feeling happy at a given time and being happy for a lifetime, between having a good time and leading a good life. And we, ha we have a handout with a river on it. That quote, that full quote with some more information is on there. And we encourage you to read that. It's, it's on, the, on, the, on the front On the front page. fold out. If it's not happiness that we're after, the question is, what are we after? Former president of the American Psychological Association, Martin Seligman, did phenomenal research on depression and persistence. It was outlined originally in his book, Learned Optimism. Over the years, he used this cognitive therapy approach to help people that had mental illness. So mental illnesses and the way that psychologists approach it would be to study the people who are sick, who have anxiety, depression, borderline personality disorder, and substance abuse, to identify assessment protocols, describe the symptoms, and come up with treatment protocols and measure kind of their improvement. And they, you know, they list all of this in the diagnostic statistical manual that psychologists use. What Seligman found was that he could take someone, if zero is not depressed and negative 25 is severely depressed, he could take somebody at a negative 25, use cognitive therapy, and get them up to a negative five or a zero. They could effectively treat depression. But what became troubling to him over time was that just because they moderated depression, it didn't mean people were happy. People often describe themselves as not being depressed, but feeling empty. It got Seligman wondering about the whole field of psychology and the way they approach it. And it led him to really lead a change in the way psychology does research and approaches human well-being. And this field is called positive psychology. So instead, what they did is they started to study people who are happy. They tried to look at people who are living good lives and identify characteristics or phenomena that they had in common. The most recent model that they've presented is what we're going to talk to you briefly about today. It's called PERMA. And essentially what they're arguing is that a good life involves positive emotion, engagement, meaningful relationships, meaning, and achievement. So initially, when they looked at positive emotions, they thought about a couple of things. They thought about how we think about the past, our present, and the future how we can learn to savor and enjoy experiences that we're having in the moment. I talked to students about this, where they might sit through an econ class with Jim Curl. They're afraid to take the class because they hear it's hard. But they love the experience because he's an amazing professor. But how many of them think about the fact and savor that opportunity that here's a man who's a faculty member. He's a former state president. He was on Reagan's Economic Council. He's worked closely with world leaders and people like Colin Powell, and they're sitting at his feet learning. All they're thinking about is, how do I get out of here with a C, right? And so, so it undermines their experience, rather than being able to actually savor that experience and appreciate what they have. Another part of it is they identified character strengths. It reads a little bit like a Sunday school lesson. There's 25 that they identified that are common among people who report high quality of life. These are a few that we shared with you. I'm going to talk about three briefly. So kindness is a character strength that they argue leads to a higher quality of life. One of the studies that they did involved three groups. They had a control group that didn't do anything. They had a treatment group that did seven acts of kindness, one day a week, over a week. And then they had a third group that over a week on one day did seven acts of kindness. So you've got people doing one a day, another group doing seven in one day, and then a control group. What they found is the control group had little or no change in their overall well-being. The group that did one act a day for seven days had a moderate boost in their well-being. The people who did seven acts in one day 
had a big boost that was extended over a week or two in their overall well-being. They've done research on most of these character strengths that shows when people actually try to use these strengths, it makes their lives better. They have a great assessment online, and the website is also listed in resources there where you can go on and take this assessment and identify your character strengths and then try and use them in your lives. So another one is gratitude. And what they found is, and a lot of people have done research on this, is that people that have a heart of gratitude are happier. One of the things that they did when they were studying protocols to use for people that were depressed is what they call a gratitude letter. So you think about somebody who's had a positive impact in your life. So I want everyone here to think of one person who really has helped you in a way that changed your life. Then what you do is you sit down and you write that person a letter and you tell them how much you appreciate what they've done and describe in detail how they helped you. Then you contact that person and you meet with them face to face, perhaps over lunch, and you read them that letter. People who do this report a tremendous boost in their overall well-being and happiness. Matt and I have done work for a number of years in wilderness and adventure therapy where they work with youth who are struggling with behavioral and emotional problems. So we went to a company where we gathered data and said, hey, you ought to start using some of these character strengths in your program to move from a deficit to a positive model, um, employing positive mo uh, psychology techniques. So one of the companies that we work with began using the gratitude letter with the youth. Now, I don't know if you know much about this, but parents struggling with kids who are using drugs, stealing things, failing in school, they're promiscuous and lying and oppositional, the home just becomes in an unimaginably difficult place. Sometimes these kids are then taken and put into the wilderness where they do wilderness or adventure therapy for eight to 10 weeks. Often the kids are placed there against their will. So when they get into the wilderness, they're mad at mom and dad. The reality is the kids are there because mom and dad have the power and the money. If the kids had the money and the power, the parents would be in the wilderness. So, so <clears throat> They're mad, but after spending a week or two in the wilderness, they start to think, man, mom's a great cook. <laughs> Way better than this backpacking food. Beds are awesome, and so are showers. And then they start to think about their parents in a different way. Rather than seeing them as an enemy, they start to become grateful for what their parents did. So what the staff do is they invite these kids to write a gratitude letter to their parents. The parents show up at about week four for a seminar where they are taught some parenting skills and relationship skills. Then for the first time, they're reunited with their kids. And these parents and kids have been in major conflict. They get together, and the kids read this gratitude letter. And I don't know if you can imagine what it's like, but the therapists tell us from their anecdotal experience, this is the single most powerful therapeutic intervention they use in the eight-week program. It changes the relationships in ways that's hard to describe, and it maintains over time. The kids feel happy, the parents feel happy, and these are people who are in major conflict prior to that. Another one that you can do is what they call what went right today. And this is simply stopping at the end of the day and taking a minute and think about, OK, what went great? And the reason you do this is we usually are dwelling on what? On what went wrong. So when you start to think, man, I had a great lunch, had an opportunity to go talk to my friend, or you know, something that I did at work with. I actually finished a project that's been really troubling me. When you do that, that tends to give you a greater sense of gratitude and boost your positive emotion and make you feel better. On your flyer, your little map, there is, we identified a number of other strategies that they've done studies on that have a positive impact and listed them there. If you need more detail, you can grab one of the books and read it, but those, some of those examples are there. So the next step in the model is is this idea of engagement. That when people are more engaged in their lives, they are happier, they, they feel more fulfilled. Some of the research around this idea was also done by Chicksamahai, who uh, Mark mentioned earlier, and who it takes a long time to pronounce his name correctly, and I'm not even sure if I'm doing it right. But he studied individuals who were engaged in creative activities, artists, writers, painters, and all of them described a similar type of experience when they would lose track of time. They'd become so engrossed in an activity, they wouldn't think about what was going on around them anymore. There was this intense concentration on the, 
the skill that they were using and the thing that they were doing. And a lot of them talked about this being a flow experience where their challenge and the challenge and the skill level were balanced in a way that they engaged in flow experiences, which is sort of represented in this, in this chart here. And this idea of flow is key to engagement, that when we have opportunities in our lives to find this balance between challenge and skill, we can have flow experiences. This also goes for the people that we work with. If we can help structure workplaces so that people can continue to develop skills and face new challenges, they find more meaning. This goes for kids as well. It applies to really anybody. And an example from my life is the first, the first time that I ever guided, when I was about 14, and my dad decided that I should guide one of the paddle boats on a trip that we were doing on the west water of the, on west water of the Colorado River. And we came up to a raft. I was scared to death. This was not my free choice in this. It was my time to become a man, I guess. And, uh, we came up to Skull Rapid, which is pictured here, and we pulled over to the left to scout, and I just happened to be the last boat in, which meant that I needed to be the first boat out to go down the river. And as, we, as I pulled, as I gave commands and we pulled out into the current, the current caught the nose of the boat, it flipped us around, I tried to correct, and we ended up backwards going down the river. And I have this image in my mind of my dad standing up on the rocks laughing as we went over Skull Rock backwards. And the boat tacoed, meaning both ends sort of touched each other. We were all smashed on the inside. We made it out OK. But this was not a flow experience, right? This is very much more on the anxiety scale. Luckily, I kept rafting. I gained more skill. And as the years went by, I, I would seek out opportunities to find more challenging rapids. This is a, this is a picture of Locksaw Falls on Locksaw River in northern Idaho, which turned into one of my favorite rivers, very challenging very high energy rapids, but as my skill level increased, I would not go to these types of experiences in, in fear, but the, it would turn into flow type experiences. And so being able to find opportunities to balance challenge and skill in our lives can be really powerful in terms of engagement. Another thing- Matt, really quickly. Oh, go ahead. So the research suggests that flow occurs more often at work than in leisure. What that says is we're not very good about the use of our leisure time, but also that people actually get involved and engaged in work in ways that can be great. The question is, can you as leaders at work find ways to help people engage in flow because then they're more creative and productive and they like what they do? Excellent. One of the other issues related to engagement is that for a long time, organizational behavior and leadership scholars and, and practitioners have focused on time management. So if we think about Stephen Covey's work and, and you know, doing, starting with the end in mind and first things first, which are all great, right? But we ultimately all have a finite amount of time. And there's been a movement recently to focus not just on time management, but on energy management. That as we go throughout the day, there's certain things that we engage in that energize us. And there's other things that suck energy away from us. But we don't always think intentionally or consciously about what those things are. And if we can structure our lives to do things that energize us, it can have a huge impact. We've actually included a link to an HBR article on your resource list that, that talks about this and, and gives some great examples from a process that uh, a, a major bank went through to train people how to energize themselves in different areas and simple things, like the power of taking a break every 90 minutes or going to lunch with a colleague as opposed to just sitting at your desk and having lunch alone by yourself. Also, if you can start your day by doing things that energize as opposed to suck energy away, I mean, many of us will go and the first thing that we do is we jump on email and there's sort of like this sugar rush with email because we can get things you know, clicked and push buttons and things go away and new things pop up, but it's not necessarily energizing. And so if we can find things, especially to start our day, to energize as opposed to suck energy away, we can become much more engaged in work and at home. So relationships is one that most of us would think of in terms of creating a high quality of life. Yet we might not spend time and effort to really build and strengthen our relationships. Clayton Christensen talks about this in his book as something that we might focus on building a career and neglect our relationships, which leads to problems. It's a key component in flourishing. And one principle that we've seen, just in general, when you look at working with families and leaders and organizations, 
is that there's people that we have difficult relationships with, and you can all think of those in your lives, but we might hope that they would change. Then our circumstances get better and we're over that myth, we'd be happy. It's pretty clear that we are the ones who have control over our interactions and can invite others to change in the way that we interact with them. We've cited a book called Anatomy of Peace, which talks a little bit about this, and it's also used in therapy for families, but, and there's a, a leadership component of it, another book called Leadership and Self-Deception. If you want to learn more about one approach to strengthening relationships, you might think about that. As a river guide, you show up, and the, the clients get there, and they're going to get in a boat, so they get to choose. And when they're choosing, you're thinking, uh-oh, do I get the loser dudes, right? Those are people who get in, and they're not very strong, or they're not paying attention, or they think they know what they're doing. So when you tell them to turn right, they paddle the wrong way. So the whole day, you're fighting them, creating all this energy. Or you get a group of people who are just strong, they're really intense, and they dig it, and they want to do everything right. So when you say right turn, you get a right turn immediately. It makes the experience so much better. You might think about in your relationships what kind of boat you're on. You have people pulling against you all the time or with you. And one of my colleagues, who I love to work with, Curtis LeBaron, does research on this and says that we can seek out people who bring us energy, and then we are more productive and have more fun and get better results as we do it. Let me, let me talk about this then. Okay, so one thing that we've that's happening in organizations is organizations are bringing traditional sort of non-work recreation amenities into the workplace. And, and Mark and I and some colleagues at Texas A&M University have been doing research in this area because what's interesting is in the workplace we have social hierarchies and organizational structure that dictate the ways in which we interact with each other. But recreation in the workplace provides a, a different type of space where those structures tend to go away. So I may be an entry-level accountant, but I go and play basketball with the VP of marketing and develop a relationship that's separate from the organizational structure. But when I go back into my role, I still have that relationship and it can become an instrumental and collaborative opportunity in the workplace. And so it's interesting as we go out and look at these organizations who are doing this, one of the reasons that they're doing it is to promote relationships in ways that they can't in the everyday work flow. The way that the positive psychologists define meaning is being engaged in something that's bigger than yourself or, or outside of yourself. For, for many people, this is religious affiliation and being involved in some type of religious denomination can provide this meaning and, and that makes an impact on the richness of people's lives. It's also potentially connected to service. Using the skills and talents and resources that you have to serve other people can be incredibly meaningful. And for those people who really get engaged in service can, can change their lives and perspectives. We've talked a little bit about wealth and the fact that getting more stuff doesn't necessarily improve our lives. Maybe for a little bit, right? But somebody else is gonna have cooler stuff than us and we'll all, always be chasing after more. But there is research that suggests that if we spend money on experiences, it can have a positive impact, especially if we're spending time and money sh having shared experiences that, with people that matter to us. Here's four characteristics of meaningful experiences from this research. Experiences that provide a sense of social connection or that make a memorable story. Experiences that are tightly linked to the sense of who we are or, or who we want to be and unique opportunities that elude easy comparison. Those can be very powerful. Those memories become richer over time. They may become more inflated over time too, but that's okay, right? The older we get, the better we were. But the power is in those experiences. Mark has a great story along this, these lines. So go back for one second. I just want you to try and remember these as you think about this experience that I'm gonna share with you. So we've done some work with leaders where we use outdoor adventures to achieve outcomes and teaching principles around management and leadership. One of the clients decided that they wanted to, after going through this experience, to bring their family out and participate with us. So she brought her husband, her two young kids, and her in-laws who were 76 years old. He was a retired ophthalmologist. They were from Boston and they had never been to Moab or done many outdoor activities. So the pictures on the outside the, the, the grandparents told us, hey, we are not going to go down this canyon and do these 100-foot rappels. There's no way. So don't even talk to us about it. They're afraid that we're going to push them into it. 
as we did the practice repels, you could see kind of the wheels turning in their head and they're thinking, man, we might be able to do this. They ended up going with us down a technical canyon, climbing through some washes and narrows, getting on a belay, rappelling down to two beautiful narrow canyons 100 feet, and then hiking out three miles. They had pictures of this. So they go home and they show their kids. What are their kids saying? You guys are nuts. Don't be doing that. You're going to die. You're too old for this. And they show their friends. So it creates legends. It created stories. And they wrote us a letter that essentially said, thank you. You changed our lives through this experience. 76-year-old retired doctor and his wife all of a sudden think, man, we're not getting ready to die. We can still do cool things. And um, they did. They kind of continued on. So the A in the PERMA model is achievement. Other similar models also talk about competence. So to build a great life, it's important to think about what it means to build achievement and or competence. Matt and I and a colleague for a number of years did research working with kids who came from difficult home environments to help them gain a sense of control and competence in their lives. So we teach these young kids who are 12 and 13 to guide whitewater rafting, to rock climb, to mountain bike. We would systematically generalize that to academic efficacy to increase their belief in their ability to perform in school. It's amazing to watch these kids and the impact it had on their lives. As you think about this, you need to think about yourself, if you have children or grandchildren, and the people that you lead at work, and how you can help them build competence and efficacy and achieve. Achievement is a key component in really creating a meaningful and robust life. This is a young man who just learned how to ride a bike. So this kid had this experience. He learns to ride a bike, and he's all excited. I don't know if you can remember doing that, but he's, his, what he says is profound. He doesn't say, if you believe, you can do it. What he says is, if you can't do it, keep trying. And the key to achievement is persistence and good coaching. The research on habit and talent suggests that most of us can learn to do things that we don't know how to do. I have a close friend, Dave Stewart. I don't know if he's here with us today. I don't see him. He and I would ride bikes together. And we're with this cardiologist, right? So this cardiologist buddy of ours does stents. Probably makes 20 grand a pop. His chain breaks. So I take out a chain tool, and I fix his chain. And he's watching me like, wow, I can't believe it. And he's like, Mark, I could never do that. And I'm thinking, man, if you can't do this, I can do stents at 20 bucks a pop. Just supervise me or whatever. So, but the phenomena here is he literally believed that he couldn't fix a chain. That's nuts. He had this framework in his mind that he wouldn't be able to achieve that. And in fact, he could. So the question for you and for your family and those that you work with is, are there things that you can achieve that you just don't do because you don't have the efficacy to do it? So here's where we were. We talked about the myths. And we need to be aware of them. Like on the river, it might look really easy. But if you are not intentional in building a good life, it may not happen. We talked specifically about this model, which is identified in the book Flourish by Seligman from positive psychology that talks about positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and achievement that we've briefly discussed with you, which is a great way for you to think about how you might approach building a good life. What we want to do is to get you to think about how you would do that. So if you look on the back of the handout that we gave you, one of, our, one of our student workers did this great river for us. 
So if you think about this as sort of charting your life on the river, there are three places for you to write down specific things that you're going to do as a result of our discussion today. Those may be things that came to mind as Mark and I were talking about different issues, or if you want to go back to the research-based research exercises on the other side and, and pick three of those things and write those down. Before you leave today, we'd really encourage you that you actually write something down specifically that you're going to do. And a lot of these aren't big deals, right? The, the gratitude exercise of writing three things down at the end of each day has profound documented impacts on, on people's sense of, of well-being and satisfaction with life. So look over that list, identify three things that you're going to put down on your river map here, and we hope that you find some increased satisfaction, fulfillment, ideas of how to become more engaged, develop relationships, all of these things that we've talked about today. We really appreciate you being here and for your time, and thanks so much. Thank you for being with us.